Welcome to my channel guys, my name is Prince Cloudy and this is True Crime and Chill. Welcome, hi, um, yeah, so like I said, this is True Crime and Chill and this is where I come to talk to you guys about some of the most shocking true crime cases that actually happened in South Africa. So yeah, if you are a fan of true crime and you want to keep hearing more from me, why don't you go ahead and just hit that subscribe button and like the video and comment down below what you think after the case what you think happened, your theories, and all of that, I, I would love to hear from you, okay? Because, listen, I'm a fan of true crime, all right? I'm a fan of true crime myself, so I love talking about these things. So if you also want to keep hearing from me, if you want to keep on interacting with me about these cases, because I'm going to be covering a lot of South African cases, it doesn't matter when it happened, even if it happened a few years ago or just recently, if there's enough information to cover it, trust me, I will be covering it. So yeah, we're just going to chill and we're just going to talk about it. After all, it's called true crime and chill. Anyway, this is actually my first case. It's my very first case. I am so excited. Um, a little bit nervous, but also very excited. So yeah, um, if you are watching this and you are part of the first people to ever watch my true crime channel, look, thank you so much for your support. I really appreciate it. So why don't you, let's just dive into it, okay? Let's just dive into it and um, let's see what I have for you today. Let's just see what I got for you today because today's case, my first one is quite a hectic one and it was actually covered quite a lot in the media. It was a popular case and it's very well known, but if you don't know about it, don't worry about it. I have you. I have your back. I'm going to tell you exactly what this case is about. But I got to say, it's a very shocking case. Like something like this having to happen is quite tragic. And it is almost unbelievable because it sounds like it's something out of a movie. So yeah, you better strap on and get ready for this one because I'm about to take you on one hell of a ride. Okay, so today's case is about the Van Broda family murders. Have you heard about it? Do you know about the Van Broda family murders? Well, let me tell you all about it. Let me tell you all about it. So this is the family of Martin van Breda, who was 54 years old at the time. He was the managing director of the Australian branch of Engel and Volkers. They are an international property group with a number of franchises. And um, Martin was a successful businessman, you know, who was described to be a well-liked person. And when I looked at his pictures, I could also see that, you know what? They really hit it on the nose with that one. You can look at a person and see that this man was just a humble man who just wanted to provide for his family, who just wanted to live a good life. And yeah, he looked like a very down-to-earth kind of person when I was looking at his pictures. So I was, I was not doubtful of that description. So like I said, he was a successful businessman with quite a number of companies that he directed. It wasn't just Engel and Volkers. He had directorship in quite a number of companies. I think I saw a list of about 25 companies. So yeah, he was a really successful man. And with that, of course, came a lot of wealth. He was a wealthy man, but of course, he was still so humble. And that's what I respect about him, even though I don't even know him. But I respect that about him. He was married to Teresa van Breda, who was 55 years old at that time and she was described to be a lovely woman by her daughter molly which i'm also going to talk about a bit in the video so yeah i also looked at her pictures as well and i could see that hey no no doubt i can tell that you know she's actually a very good woman i can see that she was a a family woman i could see that she loved her family and she wanted to do the best for them as well so she was described to be a lovely woman um, by a lot of her close associates, close friends as well, close family friends. So Martin and Teresa had three kids together. Their first, their firstborn was Rudy van Breda, who was 22 years old at the time. And their second born was Henry van Breda, who was 20 years old. And their third born was Molly van Breda, who was 16 years old. So the family was described to be a close and loving family, a lovely and close family. And you know what? They just loved doing a lot of things. I saw in one of their pictures, they were always out doing things and they loved doing certain activities together. They were an outgoing family and it showed that they actually were close. So they were described as 
a close and lovely family with awesome kids. They were originally from South Africa, but they lived in Australia for eight years until they moved back to South Africa in 2014. But when they moved back, Henry and Rudy couldn't move back with them because they were still in university at that time. So when they came back to South Africa, it was Martin, Teresa, as well as Molly. But then Henry and Rudy stayed behind to finish up school that year. So Henry and Rudy didn't join their family back in South Africa until I think um, the end of 2014, between the end of 2014 and the beginning of 2015. They joined their family back in South Africa. So the family lived in an estate, a golf estate in the Western Cape. And this place was actually described to be a maximum security estate with an alarm system, around the clock, guard patrol, access control gates, an electric fence so it was a pretty safe place to live in it was actually described to be one of the safest places to live in in the western cape and as i was looking it up it is beautiful it is gorgeous just like you know what i wouldn't mind living in a place like this if i had the money i would have moved there a very long time ago it is an extremely beautiful beautiful estate so one night of january 26th in 2015 it was just a normal night nothing big happening um, Teresa was in the kitchen, Martin was busy on his laptop working, Henry and Rudy were watching TV, and Molly was doing her homework upstairs. And around 7.30 p.m., the family sat down to have dinner, and by midnight, everyone was in their beds, with Martin and Teresa being the first ones to, to go to sleep. Henry and Rudy shared a room, and Molly had her own room, and then, of course, the parents had their very own room as well. Everyone slept upstairs and it was just uh, lights out, everyone was out. So Rudy was the first one to go to sleep between him and his brother because Henry at that time was watching a series in bed until approximately 3 a.m. in the morning. And then he decided to, around that time in those early hours, he decided to go to the bathroom. He decided that he needed to go to the bathroom and as he was in the bathroom, he said that's when he started hearing sounds coming from his room. And so maybe he thought that his brother was awake. You know, maybe he thought that he was awake. And then he went on to go check what was happening. And this is when he said he saw a tall, large in size, black man wearing a balaclava with gloves, continuously hitting Rudy with an axe. And Rudy was just lying there in a pool of his own blood. And... Because of South Africa's high crime rate, we all know how crime is taking such a toll in our country. The story of an intruder in a mosque attacking in the middle of the night is one of the most common things that happened in South Africa. So it would have been very easy to believe this story. And I'm saying this because around that time, around that time, there were actually reports of a gang known as the Balaclava Gang. And they were known to commit a series of break-ins of break in a number of homes. So it was thought that this could have been a crime that was related to one of their crimes that they committed at that time. So when Henry found out that this man is killing his brother, he said that that's when he screamed out for help. And then Martin came in to quickly check what was happening. And then he also saw this horrific um, scene that was happening. And he tried to fight off this intruder, this alleged intruder, from um, trying to stop him from hurting his son. But I think at this time, Rudy was already gone because Mo because Henry said that um, Rudy was just lying there in a pool of his own blood. So I don't think he was alive at that time. But then Martin tried to, tried to fight him off to stop him from continuously hitting his, his son. And Henry said that all he could remember, all he can think about, whenever he goes to sleep, he gets haunted by the laughter of this person as he was hitting his brother so he he's, he's haunted by what was happening that night he's haunted by everything that took place but then like i said martin was fighting off the intruder but unfortunately martin didn't come out the victor in that battle and he ended up losing his life as well he got killed by this alleged intruder as well so after being done killing martin and rudy the intruder then walked past Henry to go to Teresa, who was standing in the hallway, because she also wanted to know what was going on. But then this man just went to her and he and he attacked her as well with the axe. 
and he, he killed her too. And then he attempted to go kill Molly, but Molly actually survived the incident that night. But um, her injuries were quite severe. And well, this is the version of Henry's story. This is the version of what happened that night. So after striking Martin, Rudy, Teresa, and Molly, the intruder then turned his attention to Henry and he tried to kill him as well. But then Henry said that he actually fought him off to a point where he managed to take the axe away from the intruder. But then when he did this, the intruder took out a knife. And even though they battled for quite some time, Henry actually sustained a couple of stab wounds, including one to the torso. And then the intruder ended up escaping. So after this intruder escaped, Henry said that he then tried to call the girl that he was dating at that time. Her name is Bianca, but Bianca didn't pick up the call. So after a few attempts of trying to reach Bianca, Henry said that he then passed out on the floor and then woke up two, uh, two hours later, around 7 a.m. So after waking up, um, Henry said that he then called the emergency services to report the incident and he tried as much as he can to explain where he lived, what had happened. And then after talking to the emergency services responder, the police were actually dispatched to the scene. But the police themselves say that in their years and years of experience, they were not ready for that kind of scene. That was one of the most horrific scenes that they had ever seen in their years of experience. So it was quite... Was quite shocking to witness so henry's sister molly like i said before she survived the incident right she survived what happened that night and even though she survived she didn't go off unscathed okay she had to undergo extensive surgery they took her to the hospital because they found out that she was still alive she was still moving at that time and when they saw that there could still be a chance to save her life they took her to the hospital where she had to undergo extensive surgery, where she had to undergo physiotherapy because she suffered, it was said that she suffered five blows to the head and one blow to her jugular as well. Unfortunately, however, she ended up losing memory of the entire incident of what happened that night. She lost, she couldn't remember a single thing. And you could say, you know what, if you look at it from the greener side of things, even though she didn't remember, she didn't have to live that traumatic um, scene of, of herself being, being attacked by this person. But it is still unfortunate that she ended up losing her memory because if you think about it, she could have been a very credible witness to what happened that night. But she couldn't remember a single thing. So, But it is very, very good that she survived. She ended up making a very good recovery. And people were just proud of her that, you know what, she didn't just try to she didn't just let this man come and attack her and take her life she actually had self-defense wounds that showed that she fought the hardest and i think that is what led to her survival that ensured her survival the court ended up using molly's extensive head injuries as well as her other self-defense wounds as testimony in court and like i said she fought the hardest it was said that she's the one who put up most of a fight and this ensured her survival so yeah, even though they couldn't access her memory, even though they couldn't know exactly what happened because she couldn't remember what happened, they still used her head injuries as testimony in court. So a short while after the murders happened, Henry met a woman who would later become his girlfriend. Her name is Danielle Jans von Rensburg. I hope that I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I'll talk more about Danielle later on in the video, okay? So just keep her in mind. The police investigated the scene at the house and they took Henry's statement. And the leading investigator on the case was Sergeant Detective Sergeant Marlon Apollos. And what baffled the investigators as well as um, Detective Apollos was that there was no sign of forced entry into the house. There was no sign of burglary and all of the valuables were still accounted for. There was still there, nothing was taken. So it really didn't look like a robbery or a burglary. So Henry was taken to the station for more questioning. And after the investigation was done, the detectives and the rest of the investigators decided that, you know what, there's something off about Henry's story, that something just doesn't quite add up because the crime scene doesn't actually 
describe what Henry said happened that night because there was no sign of forced entry. So his version of the story and what the crime scene is showing are two different things. So the investigation went on for 18 months, after which the police then decided that Henry is the only possible suspect of this case because the circumstantial evidence couldn't just prove his version of the story to be what happened that night. So it was decided that Henry is the only suspect of the murders of Martin, Rudy, Teresa, and the attempted murder of Molly as well. You know, what was also so strange about this was how calm Henry was. It was said that he was very calm as he was talking to, to the emergency services responder when he was describing what had happened that night. He showed no emotional trauma whatsoever, and he was just smoking his cigarettes in the morning. He made the call, but he didn't show that he was just, he just witnessed his entire family get brutally attacked, leading to him losing his father, his mother, and his brother, and almost losing his sister. He showed no emotional trauma, and that, even I thought of that, that was a little bit strange when I was reading up about it. It's like, anyone at that point would be freaking out i know i would be freaking out so I, I don't even think i'd be able to speak you know but henry was just calm he was smoking a cigarette talking to the emergency services responder describing what had happened that night as if he did not witness any of it so remember how i told you that henry was then um taken as the only suspect of this case on june 13th of 2016 he actually handed himself over to the police under the guidance of his legal team. So yeah, that happened. And then the next day on June 14th of 2016, he was charged with three charges of murder and one charge of attempted murder and then another charge of defeating the hands of justice. Just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, it actually did. Because on September 2016, him and his girlfriend, Danielle, were arrested in Cape Town for possession of cannabis, the green plant. So Henry had to stand trial on the 4th of April in 2017, and the trial went on until the 7th of August in 2017. So the trial only took a few months to be completed. Remember I mentioned that he had a new girlfriend, Danielle. We just spoke about her right now, about how they got arrested. She and Henry met in 2016 at the Capsicum Culinary Studio in Cape Town, Salt River, Cape Town. And they were both students at this culinary school. Danielle believed that Henry was innocent. She didn't think that this man that she had grown to love was capable of anything like this. She said that there wasn't enough evidence to point any of this to Henry. And Henry was just too sweet and too kind to ever do anything like this to anyone, especially his own family. So she didn't believe that he was guilty at all. She stood behind him at every turn point. And she wasn't the only one who was on Henry's side. Henry's aunt as well, Narita Dutoit, also believed that Henry was innocent of these charges because she said that there simply wasn't any motive for Henry to do something like this. And Henry wasn't an aggressive child. Henry was always a good kid. Henry didn't show any sign of aggression or dangerous behavior. So she just couldn't believe it that her nephew would do anything like this. So she believed that Henry was innocent of all these charges, that the police had just made a mistake and they were supposed to go out there and find the right culprit for this crime. But it just wasn't Henry. So Henry's aunt said that the family was just a normal Christian family with no big issues. But get this. On the night before the incident, a neighbor of the family who, li who lived just a couple of hundred meters away from them said that she heard what could have sounded like loud arguing voices coming from the Frambrota family house. So as I was reading about this, I was like, hmm, well, that sounds like it's a problem. That sounds like it's an issue if they were arguing that night. But then Henry's um, defense team Henry's defense team argued that this could have been sounds coming from a film that was being played out loud. It could have been mere sounds of a film being played out loud. And I was like, okay, that's fair. That's fair. Because the neighbor didn't really see what happened. She didn't see if really it was the family arguing. So when the defense team said that it could have been sounds of a film being played out loud, I was like, okay, okay. But what do you think?
Do you think it was really silence coming from a film? Or do you think that they actually were arguing that night? Drop your comment down below and let me know what you think. So when Henry was described by his by close family friends and his neighbors, he was actually described to be the black sheep of the family because both his siblings were doing well in university and at school and he had decided to drop out of his studies because he had no idea what he wanted to do at that time with his life. So then he took a gap year and moved back in with his parents at the end of 2014. But this could have disappointed his strict father. So he was described as the black sheep of the family, the odd one out, when he was described by his family, friends, and neighbors. Something that I also found strange about this was that, remember how Henry's aunt described him to be a good kid who didn't, do, who didn't show any bad behavior whatsoever? Well, get this. Reportedly, allegedly, Henry had a drug addiction to tick that was so bad that his parents had to threaten to cut off his allowance if he had not pulled his act together. This kind of drug is actually known for violence and aggression as one of its side effects. This really worried his parents that their son could be addicted to something like this. But remember, these are allegations. So let's not go around spreading rumors that we don't know anything of. So yeah, and his aunt did refuse these allegations as well, saying that they were just weren't true. Henry was not addicted to any drugs. But if you want to find out for yourself, you can go ahead and research all about it. Try to find out if it was actually true, if Henry was actually addicted to the drug. But when I read about this, when I read about that part exactly, I was like, well, this doesn't sound like much of a normal Christian family with no big issues or problems. So I, you know what? Yeah. But yeah, I was reading about it and then I it just, hmm. Wow. Okay, but then let's go on. So like I said, the police found no sign of forced entry into the house, right? So there was no sign that it was a robbery or a burglary, right? So was Henry just trying to say that this person walked into a, a maximum security estate and just went into a wealthy family home and decided to just go upstairs and kill people and not even take a single thing? Is that what he was trying to say? I... I I don't know about you guys, but I got to think about it and I was like, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense how anyone would walk into a wealthy home and not even take a single thing because all valuables were still accounted for. There was no sign of forced entry, no sign of a robbery. So is this Henry's story that this guy just walked in, killed his family and never took a single thing after escaping? And also, if you really think about it, if this person came in to intrude, they could have just taken everything in the house, taken whatever they could take, and then leaving because everyone was still sleeping upstairs. So it made no sense that this guy just wanted to go kill people and then leave. Unless if maybe he wanted to take them out of the way first and then try to take everything else. But still, because they were sleeping, he could have just taken whatever he took, whatever he could take, and then, and then left. It made sense that way. I want to know what you think about this. Drop your thoughts, drop your theories. Do you agree that it's possible that something like this could happen? Or do you just find it a bit too far-fetched? Let me know what you think down below. In court, during his cross-examination, which is when lawyers try to get information from a witness to try to extend a testimony or challenge a testimony that's already been given, Henry managed to reenact the whole incident. What happened that night, the fight between him and the attacker, and it appeared really strange because if you think about it, he should have been way too traumatized to try to think about what happened that night again. I know I wouldn't be able to. In my opinion, I don't think it, I don't think it would be that easy because he did it very easily to reenact everything that happened, including the number of blows dealt to his father and to his brother and the fight between him and the intruder. He managed to reenact everything action by action, detail by detail, in his cross-examination. So is this enough to start questioning his innocence and version of what happened that night? So experts studied Henry's um, stab wounds. Like I said, he sustained a couple of stab wounds 
and they studied his, his wounds and they ruled them out to be superficial and self-inflicted and that they barely broke the skin. So did Henry injure himself to try to make this seem like a, a fight that happened and he tried to have some self-defense wounds on him? Was he doing this as some sort of a strategy to take away any attention that may be pointed his way during the investigation? Experts say that the manner in which the blood flowed on his body didn't show that he was stabbed by another person. As a matter of fact, remember he said that he passed out after trying to call his then-girlfriend, Bianca? Well, they say that if he had passed out, the blood flow would have been disturbed in its direction. But his blood flow didn't show any change in direction. It just all flowed in one direction. So one of the one of, so the prosecutor actually, when I was listening to uh, a documentary that was done about this, the prosecutor said he would have had to pass out either standing up or sitting upright, which is sounds kind of crazy if you think about it. So Henry was starting to look a little bit guilty here because the circumstantial evidence that was collected at the crime scene was also starting to paint a pretty guilty picture of Henry. So he was starting to look a little bit questionable here. Forensic analysis of the crime scene, the blood spatter, as well as the blood that was on that was on Henry's shirt and socks, just couldn't prove his version of the story to be what happened that night. So according to the prosecution, there must have been an argument that happened that night and it escalated so badly that Henry decided to just take out his frustrations on his brother Rudy and then when he realized what he had done then he had to finish the job by taking out everyone in the house as well so this was the theory of the prosecution and I don't know what do you think do you think they were on the nose do you think this really was the case let me know what you think down below in the comments I will be looking out for your comments during the cross-examination it was mentioned that there was blood found in the bathroom corner of the shower and when Henry was questioned about this, he said that sometimes they cut themselves while they're shaving in the shower. And it was found that the blood belonged to Rudy. And Henry said that he never touched his brother after he was killed. So how would Rudy's blood get all the way into the bathroom corner of the shower? So yeah, that's when he said that they cut themselves sometimes while they're shaving. And this is how the blood could have gotten there. So according to Henry, the attacker never reached the bathroom. He never went to the bathroom. So this also means that the axe that was used to kill Martin, to kill Rudy and attack Molly and, and kill Teresa as well, it never went into the bathroom. So the blood could not have been transferred into the bathroom by, by the weapon or this alleged intruder. When questioned further, Henry refused that he could have been the one who transferred the blood into the bathroom himself. And he argued that since the police were also on the investigation scene, um, they could have transferred the blood themselves as well. It could have been them. So when I heard that, I was like, is he trying to say that the police were planting evidence against him? Or was he simply just trying to say it was a simple mistake that could have happened during the investigation? So still in the cross-examination, um, Henry was just still emotionless. He was just sitting there, no emotion, no I don't know, he was just emotionless. He was just sitting there, okay? And he was made again to relive that traumatic night, which was still, to me, would have, you know, seemed a little bit too much to do. But he managed to do it. And when he was asked to describe the attack on his mother, he said that he didn't see the attack happening on his mother, but he only heard the sound effects of the attack on his mom. Then the prosecution went on to ask Henry about how the blood of Martin and Rudy ended up on his shirt and Hen because Henry said that he was he was behind the attacker while Martin and Rudy were being killed and Henry said that he wasn't completely shielded by the attacker he wasn't really behind him in such a way that the blood spill wouldn't get onto him and that's how the blood ended up on his shirt so when he was asked about the blood of his mother on his socks he said that his mom was lying down in the passage and because of that the blood was actually spilling down the stairs and it was collecting at the bottom of the stairs and even though he tried to avoid stepping in it, it could have dripped onto his socks. 
He was also questioned about the statement that he had given to the police, a statement that he signed after confirming. And he said that he wasn't thinking straight at that time when he was given the statement because he had just relived, he, was, he had just lived a traumatic night. So he wasn't thinking straight because he had no lawyer next to him as well to guide him into what to say and what not to say. He had no idea of the situation that he was actually putting himself in with whatever he had said to the police at that time. So what he said in court was somehow different from what was written down in the statement, what was said in the statement. He argued that there was miswording of the content here and there, but the entire statement wasn't entirely correct. It's just that some parts of it were misworded. And when he said this, this definitely gave the prosecution the chance to question his credibility. But then Henry argued that it would seem quite unfair to hold him accountable for mistakes that could have that could have been committed by the police because he had just experienced a traumatic night and at that time he could have said anything just to get the moment over and done with so he can just go back home. But he was living with his other relatives because while well, the house was now a crime scene, he couldn't go back there. So he was living with his other relatives at that time. And he said that he could have done anything, said anything just to get that moment over and done with so he can go back home. So he went on to say that had he known what to say and what not to say, he wouldn't have said some of the things that he said. And according to him, it's not the entire statement, like I said, that was misworded. He used the example of him smoking cigarettes as, an, as um, a way to direct the prosecution on how to correctly state certain facts. It was said that in a statement he was smoking cigarettes in the kitchen, but he was actually smoking cigarettes outside while he was calling the emergency services to report the incident. So then it was brought to the court's attention that the back door of the house was open, it was left open, but then Henry responded to this by saying that sometimes they leave it open for the domestic workers in case they want to come and work in the house, but he didn't believe that the intruder could have used the back door to get into the house. And then another thing that Henry suddenly brought up in court was the fact that there could have been another attacker that night, not just one, attacker number two. He said that he heard voices while this was happening, so he could have assumed that there were two attackers that night and not just one attacker. But in 2015, when he read his statement to sign it, he didn't see that there were parts that were left out about another attacker. And to me, in my opinion, I think it's really strange that investigators wouldn't notice that it wasn't written down somewhere or they themselves couldn't note it down somewhere that, okay, we're looking for two suspects instead of one. Because I think that's very crucial in a case to know how many people you're looking for so your investigation can actually go in the right direction. So, so for police to not, to not note it down somewhere to make sure that they know that they're looking for two people instead of one was really was really strange to believe but then according to henry there were two attackers that night because he heard voices but he claimed that he didn't have much information about the alleged second attacker but he did mention to one of the detectives in his office that there could have been someone else who came in with the intruder that night and there could have been two attackers instead of one but again it should have been written down somewhere. It should have been noted that, okay, we're looking for two suspects and this would have helped the case a lot. So I don't know. What do you think? What do you think? Do you think he just made this up? Do you think there really was two people at that house who came in to attack the family? Let me know what you think. Prosecution then went on to argue that Henry could be applying selective memory loss. And selective memory loss is when someone chooses to remember certain parts of a story or certain parts of an incident. And the prosecution said that he could be applying this to try to make sure that he only says what he wants to remember so that he doesn't end up incriminating himself during the cross-examination. And then Henry refused and he disagreed to this, saying that certain parts of the incidents were just foggy in his memory and he couldn't remember everything that had happened that night. So three and a half years later, on May 21st, 2018, Henry was then found guilty of three charges of murder and the one charge of the attempted murder of his sister. 
So his girlfriend, Danielle, and his aunt, Narita, still believed that Henry was innocent of all these crimes and that there could have been any motive, there wasn't any evidence for him to do anything like this. And Henry still kept in contact with his girlfriend through letters from the prison. They still kept in touch. And she said that as long as there's no evidence um, that's, that proves that he did this, he will, she will always stay behind Henry. However, there were some rumors, you know, people talk. There's always going to be someone who says something that could have happened. So there were rumors that Henry did murder his family to try to inherit his father's million dollar estate all for himself. So they think he could have done this, but this was never proven to be the case. So it was just a rumor. But for other people, because we have such a high crime rate here in South Africa, it would have been easy to believe the story of the intruder in the mosque. Um, and so, yeah, but what do you think, though? Do you think it really happened like this? Do you think Henry's version of the story really could be the truth? Or do you think he did it? But most people also rumored that because of the high pressure that he felt to, or he could have felt to live up to his family's expectations because his siblings were doing better than him, the pressure could have gotten too much for him and he decided to just end everything and just um, be free of it all. But I'm just going to ask you, what do you think? This was, these were just rumors, theories that people came up with. They were never proven to be the case. But um, what do you think? Do you think it really happened like this? What are your thoughts? Drop them down in the comment section below and let me know what you think. And we could talk about it. And yeah. So Henry van Broder was then sentenced to three life sentences on June 7th, 2018. But his sentence proceedings began two days before that on June 5th of 2018. He is still serving his sentences to this day at the Paul Correctional Services or Correctional Facility. That is the case of the Van Broda family murders. Tell me guys, how was it? What do you think of it? What do you think really happened that night? Okay, I gotta say, this is something truly, truly shocking to know about, something truly gruesome to happen to anyone. No one deserves to have something like this done to them. So yeah, what do you guys think? Do you think Henry really did do it? Do you think he, it, it was a crime of anger? Do you think it was a crime of greed? Do you think it was a crime of passion? What do you think happened that night? Drop your thoughts down in the comment section below. Thank you guys so much for chilling with me. And thank you for being with me for my first episode of True Crime and Chill. I'll be uploading another video soon, either sometime this week, if I get done with editing fast enough, or next week but as soon as i upload you will be able to see it as a matter of fact if you want to be updated with all my uploads go ahead and press that notification bell as well to make sure that you never miss a single upload from me if you want to keep hearing from me again thank you guys so much again for being with me and i will see you guys next week have a great one